all cells must have the ability to communicate with the outside world. This includes the ability to sense and respond to changes in the external environment, but also to be able to communicate with other cells. This is as important for single-celled organisms like bacteria as it is for the cells of multicellular organisms. Today what we're going to be talking about are the different types of cell signaling and how they allow cells to communicate with each other and change in response to the changing conditions that surround them. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about cell signaling. Cell signaling is the way in which cells are able to communicate with the outside world. And whether you're a simple prokaryotic cell like a bacterium or a eukaryotic cell existing within a multicellular organism, a cell needs to have the ability to interact with their outside world in order to adjust their behavior accordingly. For example, prokaryotes have the ability to communicate with each other. Bacteria exhibit a type of communication called quorum sensing, in which they're able to communicate with other bacterial cells in order to form a complex structure called a biofilm. But bacterial cells also have to have the ability to adjust to changes in the environmental conditions, which influence their ability to perform metabolism and reproduce. But perhaps cell-to-cell -cell communication is even more important for the cells of a multicellular organism. For example, take a human being with several trillion cells that make up an entire single organism. The cells in a multicellular organism are differentiated, and as such, they have to have the ability to be interdependent on other cell types, which means they can't survive alone. They need to be able to interact and coordinate their behavior with other cells. This is, of course, going to require communication between those different cell types. But just as we see in bacteria, the cells of an, a multicellular organism also need to be able to respond to changes in their environment in order to, for example, adjust their metabolism or know when they're required to divide. Now, what's interesting about cell signaling is that cell signaling is going to require two different types of activities. First, you need to have a cell that can produce and release a given signal. They're going to need to produce some type of signal that will influence another cell, or as we'll see in a minute, even that, oh, that individual cell, to respond to changes in its environment. You also have to have a cell that's capable of receiving a signal. So as I mentioned before, particularly in multicellular organisms, not every cell produces the types of receptors needed to receive every single signal. So let me give you an example. Only pancreatic beta cells are able to produce the protein called insulin. And insulin is a signal that circulates throughout your body and is an indication that food is available and ready to be taken up by your cells. Only cells with an insulin receptor then are able to respond to that signal. Dopamine is another signal produced by some cells in your body, particularly those as a part of your nervous system. But only cells with a dopamine receptor are actually able to respond to that particular signal. So because signaling is both signal specific and receptor specific, you can send signals broadly throughout an entire multicellular organism and only certain cell types will respond because they're the only ones capable of responding given the types of receptors that they have in their plasma membrane. So as I said before, cell signaling occurs in cells of all types, whether they're single cell prokaryotes or eukaryotes like bacteria or protists or cells of a multicellular organism like the cells in our own body, they need to be able to communicate with the outside world, including the environment and other cells. But for the purposes of this video, we're mainly going to focus on the type of signaling that we observe in multicellular organisms. We're going to focus on four different types of signaling that are very common in multicellular organisms. And these are autocrine signaling, paracrine signaling, gap junction signaling, and endocrine signaling. The first type of signaling that we'll talk about is autocrine signaling. Autocrine signaling is the type of signaling that happens when a cell signals to itself. Now, I know you're probably thinking, that's weird. Why would a cell talk to itself? Well, to be honest, a lot of times it happens uh, downstream of a process called paracrine signaling, which we'll talk about in a minute. In other words, sometimes when a cell sends out a signal to other cells, it also possesses the receptor to respond to that signal. But sometimes a cell signals to itself on purpose. A great example of this happens in your immune system. So for example, when a helper T cell is activated in response to the presence of a foreign pathogen in your body. One of the first things that it does is secrete a signal called interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 is a small protein. It's called a cytokine. 
And of course, that Albert T cell has a receptor that can bind to interleukin-2. And when it senses the interleukin-2 that it actually produced, it acts as a signal for that cell to then begin to undergo mitosis and divide into two different cells. And then that process repeats itself over and over again until you have a large population of helper T cells that can help fight off an infection. Now, because that cell is producing interleukin-2, that interleukin-2 can actually influence several other different cell types that, uh, a part of the, that are part of the immune system that can also respond to interleukin-2. This is a type of signaling called paracrine signaling. Paracrine signaling occurs when a cell signals to a other nearby cells. So for example, when interleukin-2 is secreted, that particular, that particular signal can influence other T cells to also undergo the process of, of, multi, of division and differentiation. And then when those helper T cells, once they become activated, go to the tissue, that interleukin-2 that they're producing can also influence the activity of other immune cells, such as macrophages and dendritic cells, as well as other helper T cells, and get them to help to fight off the infection. This is an example of paracrine signaling. Paracrine signaling is nice because it's localized and it's often short. Another great example of paracrine signaling is what happens with neurotransmitters. So quite often what happens in your nervous system is when a signal needs to be sent, a neurotransmitter is released by a cell and it's received by another cell. Quite often when we look at the interaction of neurons with other cells, they're in very close proximity to each other and they're separated from each other by a small gap called a synapse. And when you look at a synapse, there'll be two different cells present. You'll have what's called the presynaptic cell, which produces the signal, and you'll have a postsynaptic cell, which receives the signal. So for example, if we're looking at a neuromuscular junction, what you'll have is the presynaptic cell, which will be a neuron. That particular neuron will produce a neurotransmitter, release it into the gap between that neuron and an adjacent muscle cell, it's called the synapse, and then that particular neurotransmitter will be received by the receptors on the surface of that muscle cell, which will cause the cell to react in a stereotypical way. Now, of course, we don't want that signal to necessarily persist. So for example, if that is a signal for that muscle cell to contract, we don't want that muscle contraction to persist. That could be quite painful and not particularly useful. So that synapse needs to be cleared. And typically that synapse is cleared by either the presence of an enzyme that will degrade that neurotransmitter, thereby relieving the signal, or by reuptake. In other words, sometimes that particular signal can be taken back up into either the presynaptic or the postsynaptic cell to clear the synapse and remove that particular signal. So both autocrine and paracrine signaling have the advantage of being relatively fast, but also localized and short-lived. In other words, neither of those types of signals are going to cause an entire body response in a multicellular organism such as a human being. But the fastest type of signaling that we actually have within a multicellular organism like a human being is called gap junction signaling. If you remember our conversation about cell-cell junctions, one type of cell-to-cell -cell junction is called a gap junction. And a gap junction is simply a little channel that connects the cytoplasm of two adjacent cells. And sometimes in tissues, all of the cells within that particular tissue can actually be connected to each other via gap junctions. And gap junctions allow the flow of material, such as small molecules, uh, electrical impulses, or ions, to go from the cytoplasm of one cell to the next cell to the next cell as long as there are gap junctions existing between those cells. Gap junction signaling often takes uh, often occurs through the activity of ions such as calcium that are released in one cell and then are spread from that cell to the next cell to the next cell and help to coordinate the activity of those cells. One great example of this is what happens in cardiomyocytes. So out of all of the cells in your heart only about 1% of those cells are actually able to spontaneously produce a contraction. They're the only ones that can produce the electrical impulse needed to coordinate the contraction of the entire heart, which is kind of amazing. It's actually called the SA node. And those cells act like a pacemaker to time the electrical impulses needed to coordinate the contraction of your heart muscles. Given that your heart, muscles, your heart typically beats somewhere between 60 and 100 times per minute, that's kind of impressive. This is all done through gap junction signaling. And that SA node, calcium, is, is secreted into the cytoplasm of those cells and then flows from one cell to the next to the next in a coordinated fashion that allows the heart to beat in a rhythmic manner. 
failure of these pacemaker cells to actually work can lead to severe complications and potentially death if it's not treated properly. You may have heard of some people that have artificial pacemakers put in, that's simply because their natural pacemakers are no longer doing the job appropriately. Now, gap junction signaling is the fastest type of signaling that we'll observe in a multicellular organism, but it does require one particular aspect that can be troubling and makes it not particularly useful except in certain cases, and that's the fact that the cells need to be so close that they're actually connected to each other by that particular gap junction. The fourth type of signaling is called endocrine signaling. Endocrine signaling is slower because endocrine signaling is the type of signaling that is done throughout the entire body. It's usually done through the release of specialized signals, commonly called hormones, by specific organs or glands within the endocrine system. So these could be things like your pituitary gland or your thyroid. These signals often reach their destination in very, very low concentrations, and quite often they take quite a, quite a, a bit of time in order to cause a change in the system. There are some exceptions. Adrenaline, for example, is an example of something that actually uh, reacts uh, very quickly through endocrine signaling. But again, endocrine signaling, signaling is typically used to get the entire body to respond to a certain condition. So for example, when the pancreatic beta cells release insulin that flows throughout the entire body and any cell with an insulin receptor is now aware of the fact that there is food available and they should begin taking up food in order to uh, use it for the metabolism they need in order to survive. There's an opposing signal called glucagon. And glucagon released into the system does the opposite. It lets the body know that we're no longer in a period where food is plentiful and we need to sort of hunker down until the food becomes available again. Now, endocrine signaling is exceptionally useful when you need the entire organism to respond to a given change in the environmental conditions. That being said, it's typically slow and often relies on the bloodstream to get things from point A to point B. So today we talked about the four main types of cell signaling that occur, particularly in multicellular organisms. Autocrine signaling, where a cell signals to itself. Paracrine signaling, where a cell signals to nearby cells and sometimes itself. Gap junction signaling, which relies on direct connections between the cells that are involved. And endocrine signaling, which typically relies on the release of signals like hormones that travel through the bloodstream in order to mount an entire body response to changes in the environment. What we haven't talked about yet and we'll talk about in our next video is what happens once a signal has been received by a cell. This is a process called signal transduction. And like I said, we'll talk about that in an upcoming video. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you guys learned a lot and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye.